chapter 10. A tale of two campaigns. And a lot of wars, a lot of problems start out. And you're going to notice a repeating phrase or catchphrase probably over the past few weeks because we keep revisiting a very common, common thread. We saw in this passage a major assumption. These boys are spies. We do well to ask ourselves sometimes when we make major assumptions or major statements, what proof do I have? Am I God that I know every little bit of every little equation? Have I, am I the fourth person of the deity that I can start spouting off and saying, aha, they're spies. I think that Philippians 4.8, which you've already mentioned at least twice this morning, comes into play here. And we were talking about how we need to take every thought captive to Jesus Christ as we're walking. Only Christ in your life is going to see the kind of glorification that he deserves. When Jesus comes in, he changes the life. There is a series of battles here in this particular case. And I'll just kind of run you through the scene. David was a very active person. David, in his military career at this point in his life, is pretty much running all over the country. He starts initially with the Philistines. And let me see how well we do. You know, maybe I can get there. All right. He starts his, at first with the Philistines. Forgive me, but I do shake a little bit. And... Uh, that encounter is resolved. He ends up in Hebron. In Hebron, he becomes a king. He's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to uh, succeed in gaining Jerusalem. But he also is securing this entire territory in that he is securing the area of the Philistines. And every nation around David becomes either a, what's the correct word, a tribute, tributary, tributary. Thank you, whoever said that. Who said that? Good job, Jim. Thank you. All right. So uh, God is protecting his people such that if the enemy is coming in, they don't come directly to Jerusalem. They come directly to these outside places. And after David and the work that he did, there's going to be an incredible amount of peace. Today's story happens right here in Ammon. And this David was a good friend, evidently, with uh, Hanun the son. I kind of liked how that ran together. Did you notice that as I was reading? I was like, wow, that kind of works. Anyway, uh, his father was a great person, and he got along very well with Hanun the son's father, but as far as he himself was concerned, when he sent people over because his father died, what happens? Well, they... They treat them shamefully, but they make huge, huge judgmental assumptions about these people. And it is because of that that we need to be very careful. Now, I see a lot of problems in Romans chapter 1, verses 29 through 32 that are all over this story and that create wars. Looking with me, if you would, being filled, this, this is the big bad sin list in Romans chapter 1, last parts, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate. In other words, some people just love to keep it on the edge all the time. Uh, I think kind of a drama queen, if you will, if, uh, if I have heard that, or that kind of word. Um, just simply got to argue about something. Deceit, malignity is another wor uh, word that I, I see in this. Ill-disposed, poor manners. <laughs> I think that kind of fits here. There, did you ever meet someone that just really was sour? All right. <laughs> Remember, I shouldn't tell this, but I'll go ahead. Years ago, Dad met a, a lady in church. And she's very... I don't... No, if she ever smiled, and uh, and it was his first meeting, and uh, he he said, I, I I gotta put this one out there. He said he said he met them and he said, Oh, are you his mother? <laughs> 
she was so sour, I think, that it prematurely aged her a little bit, you know. And, and, and when he looked, I mean, she looked much, much older, and, you know, she didn't look very happy. And, oh, it must be your mother. Well, we've all had moments like that, and I've had many more than my father, I think. But uh, I, <laughs> it's interesting. When, when you have this, this, when you're totally living under the burden, sooner or later it gets to your face. This illness foes, this bad manners, whispers, this goes well with the aforesaid. Uh, I can't say for sure that these people were whispering behind their back before they decided to tell the king what, what they were going to tell him about David. Backbiters to speak evil of, usually that is behind the person's back, but certainly they spoke evil of David. Uh, haters of God, I don't know how they are there. Despiteful, insulting. Would you say that there's an insulting characteristic going on in this story today? Absolutely. Proud, definitely, because you have to be proud to come off with a snap judgment. Uh, boasters, don't the rest of them not to worry about. Implacable, you can't get any kind of agreement with this person. He's unreasonable. One of the classic examples in scriptures of a totally unreasonable person uh, was uh, when G uh, when David went down to meet, uh, I'm trying to pull his name back, I think it was, he's the guy that uh, David asked if he could have some food, and his wife was Abigail. Anybody pop that name real quick? I, I wanted to say Nadab, but that's wrong. Nabal. Nabal. Thank you. All right, good. All right, Nabal. good. All right. Uh, Nabal. Uh, just, the, the Bible said he's a churlish man. Just sour through and through. You're never going to come to any agreement with a guy like this. Totally unreasonable. Uh, unmerciful. These kinds of characteristics, I believe, show up in this story a great deal. But this whole idea of malignity, I, I always thought there's another shade of meaning behind that, and that is to, to see in another person an evil motive. Now there is a problem with that. And the problem is, how many of you really know what another person's motive really is? And I'd put my hand up and I'd say, I have absolutely no clue what people's motives are. By the way, it gets a little loud in here <laughs> when we have rain. So if you can't hear me, would you go like this? Are we okay still? Yeah. All right, good. Just checking. So there's a huge problem in this passage of Scripture, and it is in this area, we need to be very, very, very careful until we are glorified, how good will our perspective be? Limited. We mentioned recently that we catch so much of the big picture, right? Who alone has the entire picture of everything that's happening in life? It is God and God alone. So, we really rely very much on Him. Now, by their fruits, you shall know them. If indeed somebody is doing something, and it's very obvious and easy to see you have something to hang your hat on, you can definitely inspect the fruit. But you can only guess about motives, and chances are it's not the best activity that any of us could be in. Well, I mean, I understand that there's a certain enjoyment in trying to figure people out, right? Uh, if you're like me, you've probably spent most of your life thinking what makes people tick, and that's okay in and of itself. But you have to be careful with that because you might say, I know what makes Matt tick, and you know what? Matt would be right to say and say, no, you don't know what makes me tick. And that would be absolutely true because I can't get into Matt's soul. I can see his face. I can see if he's smiling or not. He's starting to frown at night. <laughs> but, but that's, oh, incidentally, why it's nice to be with people is you can see expression and feedback and you know if you're, if you're treading where you'd better watch it. But uh, very important in this passage and this implacable part, no agreement, it's my way or the highway, and it's the highway, boys. And by the way, we're insulting you on the way out the door. I got to tell you, uh, things were not going well. So I'm dwelling on this first point with you for a second. What sins 
take place that precipitate a war, and what kind of thinking pattern do we have to watch out for so that we don't fall into these kinds of traps? Again, I would preface everything in this term. Whatsoever things are true. true. What if my pattern of thinking is not true? And if I act upon that pattern of thinking which is not true and step into sin, then I will act in a what? Sinful way. That much. We got to win it right here by taking every thought captive to Jesus Christ. Now there's some folks that all they ever do is sit around and talk to people with problems. Have you met folks like that? Generally they are have a little shingle. Lucy had one in Peanuts, if you remember, and Charlie Brown would come to talk to Lucy and she'd sit there and listen to his problem and offer her sage advice. Well, there are a lot of people like that, and if you do that all day, you're going to notice certain patterns. Now, just kind of bear with me, and I want to run some things, but before I get there, these people are following or trespassing a proverb in this passage, and the proverb goes like this, Proverbs 18, 13, He that answereth a matter before he hears it, it is a shame unto him. We need to be very careful about this member right here, don't we? It's very easy to render an opinion where none was really asked. And it is so important. James takes a whole chapter to talk about this guy right here. And sometimes we just need to bite down on it real hard because sometimes we need to keep that opinion to ourselves. And so that's a a constant struggle in our Christian life. Well, these guys had no trouble putting out this opinion. What did they say about David? It's men. They're spies. What proof do they have? Absolutely none. What did they attempt to do? They attempted to cheer this young man up, the king. And so all this is happening. Incidentally, it seems like they have a little filter going on in their little thinker right now. And that filter is, David is evil. Right? His whole intent is to send spies. David is evil. Now, was there any predicate for them to ever think that way? There was this much. Saul and the Ammonites. There was a raid by Saul into the Ammonites. Now, we can't say for certain that that's what they're latching on to and saying David's evil because I remember Saul. But we do have to be careful about situations like that in life, right? I have to, just because one person in a situation, I, I got a great illustration for that. Um, we were chatting with some folks recently and talking about the reputation of an institution. Now just because somebody goes to a certain institution doesn't mean that that somebody is in that stereotype. Okay? Uh, let's see, we've got to be real careful how I work with this. If I were to work as a missionary <coughs> with ABWE, there have been some rough things that have happened from time to time, but there are lots of very good missionaries, would you not agree? So we can't take this generalization and say, well, I know this one thing that happened and therefore we reject every missionary that would ever come from this institution, okay? This sort of thing could have happened, all right? I'm not saying it is, and I'm not going to get into the motive because I don't know it, but something to be aware of. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Now, that's not scripture, but... <laughs> But we have to be careful because it is scriptural to use our heads, to use discretion. If indeed they were saying that David is evil, they are employing a few problems. Now, let me show you real quick. And this, if, just bear with me if you would. This may interest you. This may not interest you at all. But these are the kinds of problems that people have when they make a mess of their life and they're talking to somebody to try to unwind it. Sometimes a person is in all or none terms. Completely. 
And this is an all or none, incidentally. These guys are spies. What's your proof? Forget the proof. They're spies. Yeah, but what's your, you know, how do you know that? They're spies. <laughs> it's all or none. That kind of thinking will get a person in trouble. Elijah, may I say, employed a degree of all or none thinking. I alone am the only person who has not bowed the knee to Baal. Did that help him? No, he was kind of tormented by that thought. Now God, in the process of working with Elijah, shows him that this thought in his life is entirely wrong. Did you notice that we're kind of dealing with whatsoever things are true? All right, I'm giving you illustration upon illustration of, of these kinds of things that happen. Uh, there are actually 12 of them. One person would negatively predict the future without considering another more likely outcome. In other words, this always happens. And so since this always happens, I'm not going to try to do anything. Every time I try to look for a job, I get told no, so I quit looking. I get, what, you you take, pick your poison and you ask yourself, is this a biblical way to go about life? Well, no, if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. So if Pizza Hut didn't employ you, I'll go with the kids for a second. If Pizza Hut didn't employ you recently, go to the next person. Maybe you'll get employment there. Don't stop. Keep looking to the Lord. This math problem is entirely too hot, too difficult. I'm going to throw out my whole major. Well, I don't know. I'm messing with you. But I've got to mess with you for a second because he deals with tough math problems. <laughs> so watch out for it. Sometimes uh, emotional reasoning. This is huge. This is our culture. Our culture is committing, is, is thinking emotionally. I feel this way. Today, I feel like I'm a six-year-old girl. You understand what I'm saying? I feel this way. Well, what does God say? You are. All right? It doesn't matter how you feel. What matters is what God says. And so, you know, you can excuse all kinds of things based upon emotional thinking. Were these guys guilty of emotional thinking? Could have been. I don't know. Hard to say. If they held a grudge against King Saul, it's possible. Watch out for it. Big problems. Now, Michelle always reminds me of this one. And this one's called uh, putting a huge label on something. Uh, everyone, if you ever hear certain words in conversation, listen for this. It will never work. Never is very global. Do you know in every single situation that you will ever encounter that whatever it is you're attempting to do will never work? Well, only if it's a really bad card, right? <laughs> but but be, be watching for these kinds of things because is it absolutely true whatsoever things are true that something will never work? Or always? There's another big word. So Michelle catches me on this because I like to throw those terms around for a while and and uh, at this point, I was working at the mission, and I was working with guys, and you know how they got to the mission? They got there because of these patterns of thinking, which can lead them right down the road into these kinds of Romans 1 situations. Understand the pattern. Know the weakness that you're dealing with so that your enemy can't take advantage of it. Watch out for it. Uh, another interesting one, and we're getting through the list, too. Uh, I know what other people are thinking. Watch out for this one. <laughs> this one's kind of dangerous, too. If there's one thing I dislike about texting, if there's one thing I dislike about email, is I have no facial feedback at all. So I don't know what's happening with the person. How do I know that my message was received right? How do I know that my message was received at all if I never get a reply? <laughs> I can't mind read. I can't guess. If I indeed have trespassed against someone, there's nobody to give me a clue, and all I'm going to get is the cold shoulder, right? These kinds of things can happen, and they lead us into the road of sin. So be very careful. We never know what another person is thinking, for sure, unless we've got the fruit right in front of us. Uh, let's see. I'm not doing all of them. 
this one happens. Uh, believing that others behave negatively because of you. Watch out for it. A lot of people make some big messes of their lives because they are concerned about other people. Well, what's the biblical relevance, Pastor Joe? The biblical relevance is this. Have you ever heard the verse in Galatians chapter 1 that the preacher shouldn't be too terribly concerned about the opinions of other people or he should not be the servant of God? That, my friends, is an example of this kind of thinking. <clears throat> Paul could have never done what he did if he didn't get out there and preach God's truth regardless of what the Pharisees and the scribes and the Judaizers were trying to do. These are all situations. If you're aware of these pitfalls, it will help you a great deal. Well, let me get off that page. I think, I think these guys engaged perhaps in a little bit of mind reading. I think they definitely engaged in an overgeneralization uh, about, about King David. King David's got to be a spy. And now there's going to be a fight. So be very careful to guard whatsoever things are absolutely true. And some good questions to ask yourself is, how do I absolutely know this? What is my evidence? Question yourself and take that question to the Lord and say, Lord, this is in my head. I'm bringing it to you. There's no way that this deceptive, naturally deceptive, spirit of mine, because the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, apart from your grace, God, it's not going to happen that I'm going to land right on the money. So I need your help. And I want to walk with you. Let the words of my mouth, therefore, and the meditations of my heart be acceptable. Alright? I just think, I don't know if y'all heard those different things that, that people notice that go wrong, that put us in some of the messes we get into, but I think it's helpful to be aware of it because as a man thinks in his heart, what? So is he. So a great deal of what we find uh, happens in that area. Well now, we see that they dealt very poorly with his servants. In fact, they cut off their beards. Now, the beards are a rather interesting situation uh, back in the day. You don't cut off people's beards. And I'm not recommending that you all ought to grow those yourselves. Especially the ladies. I'd rather you didn't. You know, It's just going to look kind of odd. But a man's beard in the Middle East is a very important part of their person. A high insult to tamper with somebody's beard. And if you can imagine, you've got your beard there in the Middle East and you're, you're going along and you're an envoy and you mean the best and you're you're trying to help out, and guess what they do? And send you out, amongst other things. So this beard to them, some guys would rather die than have their beard tampered with in this ancient world. So to us, we don't think so much. It's like, okay, fine, you're going to take scissors and shave it. It's not the end of life. We'll grow back, maybe. But these guys uh, don't mess with their beard. Do you remember when David allowed saliva to drool down his beard in the presence of a king that could have taken his life. What was he trying to do? He's trying to say, I'm totally insane because no sane person would do this. My beard is extremely important to me. The only times they would cut their beards legitimately were two times. What were those two times? Anybody know? If you were greedy, you would cut your beard. And if you were a slave, they would cut your beard. Neither situation is something that you'd say, yay, let's cut my beard. All right, so this was extremely important to these guys, and it was a huge, huge insult when they did what they did to them. Moving right along then, verses 6 to 14. And I love this word because it, it sounds like it came from my generation. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David... The children of Mon sent and hired Syrians of Bethrahel. Incidentally, don't you think they could have handled this a bit differently? Why do they have to hire a mercenary armies to fight against King David? Rather, or couldn't they have offered it like a huge national apology and said, you know what, we were so horrifically wrong, how can we make it up? I would think there would have been a different outcome, but it is what it is. Let's look at it. They are going to the Syrians. <clears throat> 
from a couple of different locations. Thousands of footmen, uh, verse 8, and the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the entering of the gate, and the Syrians of Zobah and Rahab and Ishtab and Maka were by themselves in the field. And when Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose all of the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he might not put them in array against the children of Ammon. I love this. If you were to go to a parallel passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verse 11, he makes the statement, if the Syrians are too strong for you, I'm going to come and help you. If the Ammonites are too strong for you, you come and help me. All right, and that, that basic idea of we're in this together and we're, I like to take it right down to the spiritual fight. We are in this spiritual fight together. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. We're to share the light of Jesus Christ in this particular world. And they worked together. Essentially, this whole idea of how can I help? Which is great. Isn't that much better than, than what was happening initially? These two boys are out there, and they're facing their giants. Do you ever feel like you're surrounded? Isn't it nice if somebody takes at least half the battle off your hands? And if they need some help, well, you pitch in just a little bit. I mean, that's, that's what people want to do. If the burdens get a little too heavy, how can I help? And that's a perfectly legitimate question uh, that we should constantly be looking for the answer. Now, <clears throat> I love this. <clears throat> I love this statement, and you know they really go to town, looking at this. Second Samuel chapter ten, verse fifteen through nineteen. The Syrians saw that they were smitten before Israel, and they gathered themselves together. And Hadadezer sent and brought out the Syrians that were beyond the river, and they came to Helam. And Shobach, the king of Hadadezer, went before him. And it was told David he gathered all Israel and passed over Jordan and came to Helam. And the Syrians set themselves out in the array against David and fought with him. And the Syrians fled before Israel. And David slew the men, uh, 700 chariots of the Syrians, 40,000 footmen, smote Shobach, the captain of their host, who died there. And the kings that were servants of Hadarezer saw that they were smitten before Israel. They made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians feared to help the children of Ammon anymore. Notice God is securing all of David's kingdom at this point. And uh, he is taking care of David and his family as he is working with them in this situation. And I just love the, love the camaraderie that is there. Is there resolution at this time as far as Israel is concerned with the rest of the world? Not quite yet. There needs to be a king that comes to this place someday. That our Lord Jesus Christ, who alone, uh, the seed of David, will rule and will rule the right way. I really wanted to drive one point home to you, the, the application in my thought life is the manner in which I th am thinking going to lead me into doing the right thing. And I hope that helps you just a little bit. How many of you have ever heard some of those before? Can I see your hands? One? I got one and a half. <laughs> Michelle, she's heard me, but she's been married to me all these years. I used to use this at the mission all the time. All the time. What, what things are you asking about? Oh, the, uh, the all or none thinking. Yeah, yeah, the filters that people use. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so I hope that's helpful to you. I had a couple copies of things, uh, copies of them, but I didn't want to just throw them out there. If you're interested, you can help yourself. But I thought it was very interesting. When I was at the mission years ago, why did people get homeless? They got, became homeless because of certain kinds of thinking or certain kinds of addiction that they got into. Now, the very first person they need to come to is life and life more abundant, right? Jesus Christ is the one person alone who can change your life completely. And there are people in this room who's changed completely because Christ entered in and you were one person before you met Jesus Christ and now you're that new creature. But since we are a new creature, do we just all of a sudden say, okay, I'm a new creature and I don't have to be careful. Well, whatever happened to walk circumspectly, right? 
Years ago at the mission, I was talking to this guy, and he was getting in trouble habitually. And I said, well, let's talk about your problem. And I was putting it on the board. And I said, you know, I think part of your problem is you're really using this all or none thinking. He says, I do not use all or none thinking. <laughs> and I says, okay, let's, let's chart this out. And, and everything that happened through his day, and I said, and you're saying that this is the only way that this could have turned out, right? Right, yes. And you're saying that's the only way it could turn out, right? Right, absolutely. We got all the way, filled up, a, filled up an eight, <laughs> eight by four board with absolutes. And I said, okay, and what's it called when it's this way or none other? And he went, huh? Because he could realize the first time that his entire approach to life was, this is it. And it was the Elijah thing. I alone have bowed the knee. So if you can watch out for that in your life, you're going to be a much more effective tool in Christ's hands. Because the battle that we fight again is the battle of the mind and heart. Whatsoever things are true. Who do we take every thought to? Jesus Christ. Okay, so kind of a teaching day to day. I hope that helps. And keep looking to Christ. Uh, what a, it's amazing that He loved us this much. But boy, He's doing a work, isn't it? Day by day, He is setting you apart from the world that's around you. You are consecrated more and more to Jesus Christ. And someday, not too far off, and some of our friends are almost there. They still have to get their glorified body. But it's going to be pretty cool when you get to heaven and you can't sin ever again. Won't that be great? Yeah. You won't ever see something wrong ever again because you will see perfectly. Right now, how well do I see things? Darkly, through a glass darkly, but someday, crystal clear. I'll finally get it. Right. 100%. Now, it's nice when we get 96s and preferably an 86 or above. <laughs> but someday, it's 100%, guys. Only because of Jesus. It's Christ and His work in His Word in your life. So meditate on these passages of Scripture. What do you see that's going on? What do you see that the biblical sin was? How, how does this person get here? Lord, would you please, please... Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and redeemer. I don't know. Anybody else wear that verse out in prayer besides me? <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand, but I see some folks shaking their head. It's a great prayer to pray. If David needed to pray it, I guarantee you, we need to pray it too. Father, thank you. We bow before you, totally looking to you, looking at what happened in this passage, in a way we recognize that you overruled what was happening with men because you were going to protect David's kingdom. And it's interesting to me, so many times, Lord, when there's something that we see it, and it looks absolutely horrific to us that we don't understand that you are able to work above and beyond what men do, and you are able to use us in spite of ourselves. If you had not laid it upon Caesar's heart to tax the world, Father, your son would not have been in Bethlehem that day, but he fulfilled your word because you worked through your world and despite what men do. So God, cause us, please, as we're in this world, cause us to genuinely be your light. And I'm asking, be your light for this week. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray, Father. Amen.